You've taken a wrong turn down Creep Street. Citizens of the Milky Way, this is Maureen Bogey. And this is Dylan Hackworth. And you are listening to the Creep Street podcast okay thank you so much for listening before we get started just quickly wanted to remind every single one of you and i mean that okay that we have a facebook okay we have a a twitter at creep street pod Mm -hmm. instagram is at creep street podcast okay we have a tiktok ever heard of it we're still figuring out how to use it but we promise within the next week or two we'll get it cooked and of course as always please remember to like subscribe share yeah tell your friends about us you know what i mean like we're talking about a cult today are you kidding me i'm not kidding i had no idea we are talking about the buddha field cult i am so pumped and jazzed i am so pumped for this and i gotta tell you folks not a lot of information about this well it's very small it's a very small cult in terms of i mean mean, it's got about a you know i think it's max it was like 200 or something right right but there's not a lot on it the most prominent source we will be referring to is a documentary film by director will allen Mm -hmm. called holy hell it's great. It's really good. It's on Netflix, at least here in the States. It's on oh, Netflix. Right. But I'm sure even if it's not available on Netflix where you are, I'm sure you could find it on Amazon somewhere. Yeah. But there is a secondary source that I use also by a former cult. Will Allen was a survivor of the Buddhafield cult mm-hmm. and also a survivor of the cult is one Giselle Coy and her book, The Buddhafield, The Chronicles of a Spiritual Adventurous, Volume 1 by Giselle Coy. Now, Giselle's story comes in when we get to the Austin location. So, Dylan, just get us going. Like, what's the deal? First thing you're going to notice upon either watching this documentary or reading the book is this cult, like most New Age self-help cults, target the wealthy. This cult in particular not only targeted the wealthy, but those who would probably broadly be considered as attractive. So yes. it wasn't just money. You, you had to have the looks, babe. Everyone One of those th- is hot as hell. Everyone yeah. was hot as hell. And we're going to get into that. Oh, yeah. So Will Allen, like I said, he's the director of the film and a survivor of this cult. And hot as hell. And also hot as hell. Now, keep in mind, the villain of this story, the, the leader of this cult, I, I believe his original name was Jaime Gomez. He changed his stage name was Michelle Rostand. He changed it later to Andreas to a billion different things. Often he's referred to as the teacher or the master. So I'm going to try to, and by the way, obviously it goes without saying, this guy is in no way a master. He's a master at being a douchebag, yeah, if anything. of course. So when I call him the master, it's only to not get confused. That's like by, what they would call him. And, right. Yeah. It's just so we wouldn't, don't get, this guy in no way is a fucking master unless it's being a fucking tool. So he first met the master, I believe in around 1985, and he was returning home from film school. William? This is Will Allen, the director of this film. Got it. You know, he came out as gay to his family and the family did not receive it that well. So he was kind of out on his own. There was this mysterious group hanging around Hollywood, and they would catch everyone's eye, partially because everyone was so goddamn hot. But the people in this group, they were looking for spirituality. But they were immediately, when they arrived, sort of given this built-in family tied around this guru, this master. And you will see this happens with cults time and time again, is that something that is so attractive about cults, and it may not be the reason for the cult or why people join it, but why people stay often is because of the community and the family that it offers you. Right. It's kind of one of those things that starts off seeming great. Exactly. And then... And while the majority of the cult members were financially well off, they weren't coming from good places in terms of emotional stability. A lot of them were looking for something. Naturally, obviously, trauma bonding. There's a little bit of the indoctrination. The book goes a little bit more into that, but it's funny because from her perspective, she doesn't necessarily see it as that. Oh, really? Which is kind of funny. She does recognize that he was an asshole. By the way, Giselle was the name he gave her. Giselle. Oh, and he... But she still keeps the name that this monster gave her. But I have seen in the documentary some people that were really, really... Yes. ...had a lot of animosity and disappointment towards Michelle. 
and they still had their the names that he gave them. Yes. So maybe some people they just do it because it's like fuck it, this has been my name for so long. Exactly. Just, you know. Exactly. Know. And we'll come back to that at the end. Yeah. Because for a lot of them at the end, even though they hated the man, they still because of the community they got out of it. Right. Have actually still have very fond memories of this cult, even though the man it was built around was a bastard. Also, let's keep in mind, this documentary was made from the perspective of a man Mm -hmm. and the book, A Perspective of a Woman. And while both men and women were mistreated, their abuses came in different forms. And Mm -hmm. that's something we will get into also. So who is this guy? Okay. Michel, Jaime, Andreas, master, teacher, you know, this guy, right? Well, when he first met him, it was at a sort of a get together in Hollywood. It was a when sort Will of, first met him. When Will first met, when the director of this film first met him, it was sort of a he was a, it was at a class meditation session, right? And these meetings would obviously involve meditation, teaching, yoga, and then of course, after all the trauma bonding bullshit, yeah, then they would sing and dance for hours. So this master, not your typical guru, all right? Michelle was obviously impeccable physical condition. Oh, he was born in South America and he was a former actor dancer. So his most famous appearance actually was for a few seconds in the movie Rosemary's Baby. So it didn't have a huge acting. Career. And we talked about that just for a little smidge absolutely. of a moment in and cursed, cursed movie sets. Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of what put us on this path. So he was pretty much shirtless all the time and pretty much only wearing a Speedo. Yeah, he, it's like, it's not just he's shirtless, it's a small ass Speedo. He had a voice that was very delicate, yet demanding. It, mm-hmm. It's a very instantly recognizable voice. And he had eyes that, to say piercing would be an understatement. I don't like looking in his eyes. They almost have an evil vibe. They really, just thinking about them just right now actually about them, makes... His eyes are quite unsettled. Yeah, my heart and chest feels like very like tight right now. Yes. So the group, they lived a sort of communal lifestyle. They would share houses with many fellow members. And they lived in houses. They paid their own rent. But here's the thing. Cult members kept their outside jobs. A large focus of this group, of course, mm-hmm. was quote unquote service. Oh no. Which we will get into. In addition to working full-time jobs, many of these cult members were working 40 hours or more a week for free for their master or for the group as a whole. But people were so eager to serve their master, there was always this power struggle. It wasn't just about serving, it was about getting close to me. Right, right. So there was always these unspoken power struggles. Well, it's also the service that they did was was complicated because some of it was just service for Michelle or the master right, or whatever. Like, like literally m- making his bed. Or yeah, like you said, like making his bed, making his food, doing right. all that stuff. But then other service was actually more kind of like either things that needed to be done for the group. Like maybe they would build something, whether that was like a building or a garden or a theater. Sometimes they would help disabled people in the group. Uh, that had some physical disabilities so to help them be able to get through their day. So it's like some of the stuff they were doing actually was, you know, community service. Exactly. But then some of it was just basically being Michelle's maid. Another unique part of this group was the idea of Shakti. Here's just the standard Wikipedia definition. Energy, ability, strength, effort, power, capability. It is the primordial cosmic energy and represents the dynamic forces that are thought to move through the entire universe. In Hinduism, and especially Shaktism, a major tradition of Hinduism. So that was just verbatim from Wikipedia. It was this idea of he could transfer this godlike energy from him to you. It was like he could open the channel. Right, like he never claimed to be God, but he was like yes. a, a spokesperson or kind of like a, right. a middleman, essentially. He, he considered himself a representation of God. Yes, yeah. They would go for meditation hikes in the woods. Sometimes in the woods, Michel would just walk up to one of the cult members and he'd put his hand on their head. People, how they would describe this sensation. And here's what's funny. Even in the documentary that's been made years later and the people now know he's a monster and they hate him, they still profess that there was something happening. They really even the people that experience Even something. the people that say he's a, a fucking monster, which he is, don't deny that there was something there was it was only they they likened it akin to a LSD trip or when I read it it almost sounds like DMT at times. Right. So jumping forward a few years to okay. 1989, one day in 1989, they were told to assemble that anyone who wanted to could ask to receive the knowing. Mm. Basically, is, it was like they were 
meeting God was supposed right. to be the idea, right? How, how they define the knowing is that it is a pure experience of God. You, you, you know God by all of your senses, by sight, touch, sound, smell. Like you just know it's, mm-hmm. it's, like, a, it's like a pure... They, there's so many weird bullshit words they use like in the book, but they use them so many times that they don't fucking mean anything. Well, it's because like each group, and it's not just cults, it's even just like everywhere, every group has like their right. own jargon. It's like corporate speak. Of course, everyone wanted the knowing. Right? Oh, you got like, to. Why the yeah. fuck not? I mean, I want it. I don't even know what the fuck it is. Right. But of course, what made the knowing so coveted was that not everyone would get it. Okay. Okay. Cast list is going up, Cast people. Cast list is going up, people. Who's going to be Maria? Right. Is it possible that some of these experiences, like I said, was it real? Or was it this anticipation, this feeling, they feel like they should have to feel this way. So when they feel it, they right. almost, like the when pow- those hands touch mm-hmm. them, it's like they almost. Your brain just is a powerful thing. I also would not be surprised if they were getting something. There's something about this guy. He's sounds, connected to something. There, there's something. He's tapped into fucking something. He looks, you guys, he's scary I, I got to tell you, at first when you see him, you're like, this guy's like kind of like goofy and like seems yeah. kind of like a Muppet and like whatever. But then you look in his eyes and it he really looks fucking evil. He really, there is a feeling of there is something inside of him that is just not pretty. Yeah. So one night, the master came to the director of the film, Will, and said that he was up all night. He was up all night fighting with God oh, that's for intense. Will's life. Shut the He's, fuck up. He said Will was destined to have an accident unless the okay. only way he could fight this okay, what is it? was to follow his teachings to the T. The next day, Will Allen received the knowing. <gasps> People were coming out of the woods. They were weeping. Some were weeping. Some laughing hysterically as if they'd lost their goddamn minds. Yeah. Will said he definitely had a beautiful experience when mm-hmm. he received the knowing, but still, this is where he specifically, and this came to different people at different times, Yeah, but this is when he specifically started to have reservations. Being like, okay. This is specifically when he started to wonder, maybe I'm getting in a little too deep. Finally, Will specifically had gotten close enough to the master that he was brought in to serve him personally. Will was his masseuse, one of his masseuses. He would massage his body. He was, he was what they called a body worker. Oh. And he was on call 24-7. Of course, all of Michelle's meals were made and prepared for him. Will moved into the house next to Michelle with, with roommates that were also part of the call. They turned their living room into a dance studio for Michelle's use. Every day, Michelle was being told how people just could not live without him. Every day. It was literally life or death. And ballet specifically became a pastime for all of the Buddha field, whether you liked it or not. He would literally hours long ballet rehearsals and would break people down. And so now you've got people having to force gratitude over mm-hmm. being forced to do shit they don't want to do. Ballet is very, very difficult. It's brutal. Brutal. And it and it can be really, really personal. Yep. This was a lot for a lot of people. Absolutely. This was like an, a And he would intense. it was very common people would break down in tears during these classes, during the, you know, ballet recitals. So another strange facet about the master was his attitude towards sex. He seemed to hate sex. While abstinence from sex was not a rule, sex was sort of frowned upon. It would turn out that actually all the Budafield members were fucking each other. Yeah. You have all these beautiful people in incredible condition right. living together. They're going to start fucking. Of course. And also, but the idea about not having sex was that Michelle thought it was like a very low. A low like, energy was low what energy. they called it. Yeah. yeah. He's like, when you have a spiritual orgasm, it's better than anything else in the world. Right. Like, oh, right. Sexual orgasm. And everyone's right. like, I kind of do. He equated it to, what was it? Like a, a, my, like a mini death, essentially. But most dangerously, though. Michelle was also a trained hypnotherapist. These sessions were called cleansings, and whatever transpired was to be kept between that person and Michelle. If there's one thing I love, it's it's unlicensed therapy. Absolutely. God, love practicing without a license. So members would come to the master with all things, even travel. One woman in the documentary told how she wasn't there for her father's passing because Michelle forbade it. That is so Insanity. fucking sad. Power of manipulation is so exactly. strong and so secretive and sneaky. 
Right. People don't, you don't even know. The abuse with this cult varies. Some people, right. it was outright actual physical sexual abuse. Some, it was emotional. It was, it, all facets of abuse came in. And yeah. you're right, sometimes you don't even realize it. Until later. Now, it was around this time that people began to formally separate and detach from outside friends and family. In okay. ni- around ni- in 1991, a guy named Kenny, who was crazy about a gal who was a part of the Buddha field, I, I guess the dude was, he liked her and she didn't give a shit. So as retaliation, he began to publicly attack the Buddha field. And he even went out, calling them a cult, and he even reached out to Rick Allen Ross, the head of the Cult Awareness Network. Okay, well, I mean, I guess if you're going to go after someone for... I- exactly. This is, I guess, good. The irony of it in the documentary, this guy is kind of described as he actually was a douche and like kind of a bad person, but he in- unintentionally kind of did a good thing. He's like, what a stupid bitch, and I'm going to really help her, and I'm going to dismantle this very hurtful cult. Let's see, the master was also feeling the heat. And so one night in the middle of all this shit storm, he and a group of close devotees just took off. They told no one where they were going. What they were doing was going out to find a new place to congregate. But devotees obviously would pine away for their master. They would send him letters and fawning videos, pledging their devotion and love for him. In fact, here's a specific quote from one of these videos. Namaste, Michelle. Thank you for reminding me to be a 1,000% disciple. I am so deeply in love with you. There's no meaning in my life except you. And whatever it takes to be with you again, whatever fire I am willing to go through, there's no meaning in life except you and whatever it takes to be with you again, whatever fire I am willing to go through, thank you for my life. Namaste, Master. Well, now that the master was feeling the heat, his strange behavior started to magnify. He started to liken himself to a Christ figure. And if he would say that every Christ-like figure in history was killed because of the truth they were spitting. The truth! Jesus, all these dudes, they, they all got it. They all got it in the end. Why? Because they were spitting some goddamn rock and roll. Finally, Austin, Texas. That's right, baby. We well, got some everything. listeners in Austin. We love Austin. We I've love never Austin, been. But I, I, I want to go to Austin. I want to we'll go. We'll definitely do a live show in Austin. Please. Finally, Austin, Texas was decided as the place where the Buddha field was to be centered. Of course. One of his disciples bought him a house in the suburbs, and people began to move in Austin. Also, at this time, when they got to Austin, this is when recruiting became even bigger, Mm. and they used yoga and ballet as big recruitment tools. Oh, to be like, hey, look how good we are at this. Like, this is fun and normal. And now, while recruiting was going very well, and their numbers were probably at their biggest they had ever been, the master was still nervous. Well, the Waco tragedy would happen not far away. And with folks like David Koresh in the news, that made Michelle very nervous. He was afraid people would start to draw parallels. We'll do, obviously, do a whole episode on this. They were even, at this time, practicing exercises in class on what to do if they were arrested by the FBI. That needs to be a sign for you. That needs to be a goddamn sign. Well, that's the thing about cults, though, is that they, they do a really good job of making you feel like you, as well as the group, are the victim and the misunderstood ones. And this group, even though recruitment was real big, the group was to be a secret, no matter what. People were sending postcards from all around the world to sort of throw the scent off the trail that they were in Austin, Texas. Like, for example, oh. Will, the the, docu- the filmmaker, his family was living in Fort Worth, which I think he said was only like three hours. I don't know how it's far like, Austin. Yeah, it's, it's like three hours away. He would say, oh, I moved to Atlanta. I moved to Mexico. I'm, I'm in Europe. I'm in, to throw the scent off the trail. And I think he even like sent presents from those places to exactly. be like, see, I'm really here. Like- At the house in Austin, they created huge gardens and ponds and aviaries. And while the group was becoming very large... Andreas just kept acting stranger and stranger. At one time, the garden had been overrun by rats. Oh, God. So Michel had his disciples take shovels and (gasps) hammers and shit and go around and kill and decapitate all the rats. Oh, my God. God. For a person who talks about fucking love and light, it was almost like a test. Like he was sending them out there to kill these. And they did it. And everyone did it. And they did it. Around this time, the master said he wanted a theater of his own. So you know what? One of his disciples went out, bought a piece of land, and the Buddha field began constructing a theater. Like that's a 
huge undertaking. A full-size goddamn building. We're not talking about some outdoor shitty little stage. We're talking this about is a goddamn like HVAC system and shit. Absolutely. Often they were forced to deconstruct their work and rebuild it several times until it was to Michel's like it. That's so fucking stupid. They would put up these extravagant ballets. And here's the other thing. So while they're in Austin, they also made an effort to recruit more ballet people and stuff. So they had a pretty goddamn good company by the time. I know. Isn't that so funny? They had a fucking ballet company. I yeah. mean, they were, when you actually, the brief clips, I don't know much oh, about. Oh, no, they, no. They're like good. Right. I don't know much about ballet, but from the clips, I see they, they look fucking good. Yeah. And they're performing it in the middle of nowhere for fucking each other. And here's the thing. Yeah. Sometimes they would rehearse up to a year relentlessly. They'd have fabrics flown in from fucking LA so people could make, you know, costumes and shit. They would re rehearse relentlessly day in, day out. And then they'd give one goddamn performance just for the group. Just and then, the then, then it was it? That was it, just for the group. It wasn't even outside. So it wasn't even like a fundraiser. It wasn't even a fundraiser to bring outside people hey, hey, to raise money. They just did it for the hell of it. They worked their asses off working on fucking Swan Lake or some shit yeah. for a year. They fly in fabrics from LA right. for one goddamn performance just so this guy can get his fucking jollies off. Yeah, he's in the middle of fucking nowhere Austin because he's already been run out of fucking California. And of course this guy, Michelle, is like the lead. It's just weird that it's like doing art just for art's sake is so great and important. Right. And hell yeah, I'm all for it. But it's like, why are you spending that much money on this? Right. Also, he would have a special chair, that it, it was a couple special chairs that his disciples would bring around that they would strap to their back. It was basically like a fucking, I think one of them said it was like an airline chair or some yeah, shit. Yeah, it looks, it's, it's stupid. And so here's a guy trying to be discreet, but he can't, you know, he's walking down the middle of fucking downtown Austin, waving him with fans and shit. Yeah. He discouraged TV, books, film, even pets. One oh. gal, one gal, remember that part in the day? One gal oh, got a yeah. pet, a dog, and she had a, I guess he just didn't fucking like dogs. And I think he just didn't like that she got it without asking him. If anyone is trying to control you to that degree, really in general, but especially to that degree, it is a bad situation. Very bad. Well, suddenly the Buddha field's focus had shifted from personal enlightenment and your personal spiritual journey to just adoring Michelle. Which is exactly what he said he did not want at the beginning. Exactly. And that's how you get people into your cult. Exactly. And that's always how it changes. He's like, hey, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm nobody, man. I'm just, a, I'm just, a, I'm just a I'm vessel just for like God. You. Also, people are becoming disgruntled, especially towards his attitude towards sex. So, like one guy, uh, one of the leading ballerinas in these ballets, he would put on. This man had he, he had fallen for this girl. Michelle knew it because he would tell him in these cleansings. And then what right. Michelle would do was discourage. Oh well, you shouldn't get romantically involved. Yeah. But then he would purposely put them together in like things so they'd be around each other. But then would discourage. You know, it was like a oh, weird it's, way. It's like of, a game. It was a game. It was power essentially. First of all. For a group that literally one of their tenants is looking as good as humanly possible. It wasn't just a coincidence that all these people were hot. It was like, it was not necessarily doctrine, but it was like, it you was, need to eat well. You, you need, need to, to exercise all yes. the time. Yeah. And then it was, so it was just this added thing of like, okay, so everyone's a fucking smoke show walking around this shithole in Austin. I'm horny but, as hell. But I'm not I, allowed to fuck anybody? I just killed so many fucking rats. Right. My dick is hard. I need to fuck something. Now. What I gotta say is just do whatever the fuck you want. Th that's the thing. Just whatever. Fuck all you want. It's when people tell you who and who you shouldn't fuck. As long as it's consenting adults, who gives a fuck? You fuck all night. You fuck all night. Fuck well, me. Fuck Michelle Rostan. Yeah. Fuck him. Yeah. Or don't fuck, but only if you don't yeah, want to. Yeah, also don't fuck who you want. Just literally, you know what? I gotta I gotta get up on my little soapbox here. Yeah. Okay? And I gotta say it, and I think the world needs to hear it, and yeah. I'm ready to be the Please. one. People are freaking out about sex, and it's really not that big of a deal, okay? And also, his plastic surgery around this time was beginning to take on a more serious look. Often he would have members of the group have a procedure done before he would, so he could see how it looked. Fucked up. And if it was safe, shit like that. Kids were also frowned upon, and as a consequence, many members of the Buddha field were getting abortions who did not want abortions. That is so sad. And it is sad. There's one woman in particular tells a story about how she got pregnant and she really wanted children. This is the same woman who wasn't, who didn't go to her father's passing because, you know, Michelle oh, didn't want her to. She got pregnant and, you know, had to take care of it per Michelle's rules. 
Later, she got pregnant again, but it was with someone in the group. And she thought, well, and it was someone she cared for. She thought, well, maybe because, you know, yeah. like philosophies, maybe he'll approve. No. In yeah. fact, Michelle told her, go get this abortion or he gets kicked out. That, like, what in the goddamn hell? What a piece of shit. And they make it seem like you are the one that has done something wrong. It's so disgusting. So let's talk about the lingo real quick. What do some of these weird, stupid fucking phrases mean that the Buddha field would use? Okay. You know, like phrases like going clear with Scientology. Yeah, they yeah, have yeah. their own stupid fucking it's, words. It's the jargon. It's the jargon. So here is the lingo. Some of it makes sense. Some of it's fucking stupid. For example, this one makes sense. Spending time with meant romance or dating. So you would say, instead of I'm dating so-and-so, I'm spending time with, which is, people kind of yeah, say I that, gotta, especially yeah. in the early days of a relationship. People go, oh yeah, I've been We're spending, spending time. time. You know, okay, I'm fine with that. Here we go. Here comes some bullshit, though. Conscious or holy company. I already hate it. Refers to people who are in the Buddha field. So if we were in the Buddha field, and we were also with friends who weren't in the Buddha field, we would be like, well, you and me, we are. We're holy company. So that's how it would be. I hate it. Going all the way. Oh, like sex? Unless you mean fucking your mind, because oh. going all the way in Buddha field speak means reaching enlightenment. Oh, great. Getting guidance. This means, quite literally, asking for significant guidance, whether it be dating, career advice. But it, because it was taught that asking, even for stupid shit, like should I fly to fucking Disney World? Yeah. Was considered as a sign of maturity of you going and asking your... Yeah, asking for permission to do things. Yeah. Literally every single thing that's mature, yeah. The next phrase... I was gone, which means blissed or intoxicated by God. Oh, I was going to say intoxicated by fucking four loco. Oh, well, honey. you know, so after a hot Shakti session yeah, or a sweet little knowing sesh, you know, you'd probably say, damn, I was gone. You mean you were uh, blissed. The body okay. used instead of my body. So instead of saying, man, my body is killing me, he goes, man, the body is killing me. Okay, I hate that and also love it. It's like the it. royal body. Yeah, I actually might, might do that from now on. Drop your body meant to die. <gasps> oh. And then, of course, I am so grateful. Ugh. Giselle Coy says, something said often and not always sincerely. <gasps> Follow guidance. Obviously, doing what the master told you to do. Deluded. Doing what you want to do in spite of the master. Often used as an insult. So this is like, what do they call them? Repre or, uh, oppressive. Oh, in Scientology? Yeah, yeah. SP, suppressive people. Suppressive people. So that's kind of there. So if someone's deluded, yeah. that's Buddha Field's version of well, suppressive people. Basically just means like a normal person. Right. And of course, service, meaning the work you are assigned to do. Mm -hmm. So 2001, people start to trickle out by now. Even though the big scandals haven't hit, people are, are already starting to trickle out. Yeah, they're being like, this is... Because it's just getting fucking stupid. A time has come. It's been a long ass time. Also, you had people who were relatively new to the group who were getting the knowing. And then there are people who had been there for a while. Weren't of course, you know, people are like, what the heck? I was here longer. When people left, they were immediately demonized, obviously. Yeah, always. He would implement the idea that if they left, they would die. That was a technique he would use to keep people. He would say, especially for residents of the Buddha field who were gay, you know, he would say they, if they left, they would get AIDS and die. Oh my he was God. Protect, so yeah, they were using this horrible- That is so fucking sick. So now people are really starting to have doubts. One guy in particular, uh, his name was David. He was in one of those short films they would make. It was like a post-apocalyptic. It was 2005. They made this post-apocalyptic like short film where he was this dude in the wasteland and he was getting some water and then all of a sudden the master shows up and he oh gives God. him some Shakti and that's the end of the short film. Uh -huh. But he said he remembered when they were filming and Michelle, you know, laid his hands on him and they were acting it out. He remembered, he's like, when we were performing, I remember thinking, I wonder if Michelle is acting right now or if he's really going to give me. Yeah. And then he thought, well, wait a second, what if it's all a fucking yeah. So that was his. So That's you kind of cool. There, you know, obviously scandals came, but but people would have these individual little moments. I think about it like the way, like when you when you put popcorn on, all of a sudden oh, they'll I all start that. popping yes. at once. But before the main pop, you always hear one or two go before the rest. And it's kind of, that's what we're seeing right now. It's oh, I love that. First yeah. few kernels popping, being like, what the fuck is going like on? In 2006, this is when the uh, Shakti hit the fan. Oh, we love this. An elder of the group sent out an email laying out huge accusations against Michelle. The biggest accusation of all was that for years, Michelle had been coercing male members into unwanted sexual encounters, both gay and straight men. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Fuck yes. this guy. But the guy I was talking about earlier who fell for the ballerina, there's this wonderful little moment near the documentary where they're talking about the fallout. And, he's, and he goes, thank God for Sophia. He goes, I had been with Budafields, you know, since teenage years. He uh, said, at 28 years old, Sophia was my first girlfriend. Yeah. And he said that she could tell. She could tell that he liked her and she liked him. But clearly he was being directed not to engage. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously they started a relationship on their own outside under his nose and that was when he kind of had they had their realization that like wait a second yeah. you know of course he told her everything that had been happening yeah because this woman Sophia she I guess approached him and was could she could tell something wasn't right exactly not even just why they weren't together exactly like she could tell something just with him was not everyone would be shocked of course truly shocked when others would come forward because they thought they were the only ones and of course he would tell them this is something just for you. This My is, master did this for me. Right. And this is a special teaching just for you. Others don't know about this. Sexual predator exactly. 101. Exactly. And they were discouraged to talk about it because, you know, what happened between you and your master happened between you and your master. And also, I think people didn't want to talk about it. This was like right. a huge traumatic thing for them. They were like, right. I don't feel comfortable talking about this. Exactly. And, you know, obviously, even though it was the men being sexually abused, like we said, Everyone was being abused in some form or fashion. Totally. The woman who wasn't allowed to go see her dying father. She had to get two abortions. She had to get two abortions. She had to tell her friends and family, this was earlier on, I think. She had to tell all of her friends and family that she had cancer. She didn't have cancer. But the reason why was because when she eventually beat cancer, because she didn't have cancer. Yeah. All the glory would go to Michelle as this great healer. So it was Isn't thing. That Tell disgusting. It, exactly. So needless to say, people then started to believe in droves. Some devotees, though, still would stay. Well, needless to say, suddenly for the first time in 17 years after the shit had hit the fan, there was going to be another knowing session. Oh, of course. He's like, no, 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 don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. I'll give you the knowing, I'll give you the knowing, come on. And apparently this knowing session was just shitty. Oh, it was God. just like half-assed. You know. well, because he is like a fucking, if he was able to actually conjure some sort of feeling to exactly. these people, now he was like fucking weird as hell and like had, had a bunch of plastic surgery exactly. and like he couldn't fucking do it. This is why here at the end, before we wrap up, I want to talk about Giselle Coy's perspective. Yeah. She was there for a much shorter amount of time. She was just there for the Austin years. Let's just, just to set the table, this is from the about section of Giselle Coy's website. Giselle Coy is a transformational coach who channels soul-fulfilling destinies for visionaries. She is known for helping people step into their full power on the world stage. Her gifts of divine clarity serve many people in positions of power. She speaks on turning your spiritual gifts into wealth and has given keynote presentations on stages such as Paleo Effects, Cosmic Awakenings, Conscious Media Festival, and others. And if Maureen, if you wouldn't mind, could you just read the mission statement from her website. I am here as a holographic, self-loving, self-governing, self-comforting, self-guided, self-inspired, co-creative force. I am here for the moment-to-moment upliftment of my heart and those around me. Knowing that our DNA is affected by those around us, I take responsibility for the magnification of my heart power in its purity. I am here to assist in the ascension of planet Earth as a vehicle for God, self-consciousness, and for the freedom and sovereignty of all beings. Let me just explain. I just want to kind of graze over her story because it was kind of different. She got the knowing. I want to read here about what that was like. I feel as if I am moving forward in space or being sucked into a tunnel only to be spit out at the other end, floating in space. It's as if I am allowed to view something new. I have no control. And it is different every single time. Sometimes absolutely nothing happens, just empty dark space. Sometimes a pin of light appears that grows and draws me in. Sometimes there's a brilliant flash of light, white hot. Sometimes there are fireworks of light and outer space scenes, as if if universes are being born. It feels like viewing creation. An energy or a state of being comes with it. 
I can also describe it as a suspended form of exaltation. I am floating in a divine current or vibration, losing the smaller self and being merged with the big self. That is all there is. Well, believe it or not, the Buddha field is still alive and kicking. What? They are no longer in Austin. They've been running. They are now in Hawaii. Even after this documentary came out? Even after all this documentary, uh, even after this documentary came out, in fact, this was Michelle's reaction to the film. It is heartbreaking to see how history has been rewritten. Holy Hell is not a documentary. Rather, it's a work of fiction designed to create drama, fear, and persecution. That is what sells. I am saddened by this attempt to obscure the message of universal love and spiritual awakening. It is devastating to see that these friends who were once so filled with love for the world became so angry. I wish them only the best and hold each one close to my heart. If any of my actions were a catalyst for their disharmony, I am truly sorry. May all beings find peace. Michelle. Okay, so he never denied anything. Yeah, he, 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 they are alive and well and now currently in Hawaii. And so at the very weird. end of the documentary, they go, they find him, and yeah, he's got hot young, you know, 20-somethings hanging around and shit, and he's, you know, he's here. Still, for some, he's still able to do it. I don't know how, I don't know fucking how. If anyone out there knows someone in this cult or something, let us know. Hmm. Creepstreetpodcast at gmail.com, because I want to know more about what they're up to now. Absolutely. Well, that's going to wrap us up for the Buddha Field cult. Ooh. Maureen, thank you so much. Oh my God, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dylan Hackworth. I'm Maureen Bogey. This is Creep Street, Citizens of the Milky Way. Good night and goodbye.